<laughs> Great start. Um, so my name is Dylan Kelly. Um, I'm working at uh, the Department of Premier and Cabinet with the um, Victorian State Government, and I'm a front-end developer there. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about um, the Single Digital Presence Project that DPC is undertaking, and the journey that we've had trying to implement a uh, test-driven development practice. And some of the challenges in doing that uh, with a, um, oh, that seems to be going straight away, <laughs> um, with a decoupled architecture. So the SDP project um, is made up of, um, of three um, sections. So it's a decoupled um, site. So we've got our content repository, uh, Tide, which is a Drupal 8 distribution. Uh, we've got a decoupled front end, which is a JavaScript application built on Nux.js and using Vue components. And then finally, we've got Bay, which is our infrastructure layer using Amazie's Lagoon. So our main site is um, vic.gov.au. Um, if you saw Emma's talk yesterday, can, um, it's, a, it's a massive site. We've got over 3,000 um, pages. There's lots of content on there. But we also have an increasing number of sites that are semi-independent, so uh, different front ends connecting to, um, to the same back end, and also uh, fully independent, so different back ends and front ends. So making sure we don't break anything when we deploy um, new releases is increasingly important. Um, so presently, when we're deploying a new release um, across both Ripple and Tide, um, to manually test all the features that we have, uh, set up content, and then verify everything works as it should. It's taking um, a manual test of approximately two or three days, um, and lots of, lots of late nights um, for uh, Jess, our delivery manager here. Um, so currently, we've got about 13 sites that are getting uh, regular updates, um, and our roadmaps to scale that up um, significantly. So we, we clearly have to um, do something here. We need to either hire lots more testers or we need to work um, out how to automate this. So out of curiosity um, of the devs here, um, who does do test-driven development? Who writes tests before they, um, yeah? And who, who never has written the tests? before, and they're like, yeah, there's a few people, and um, who's never had anything break for them in production before? <laughs> uh, Kurt, yeah, Kurt's, Kurt's the only one, yeah, good, good, yeah, you would say that. <laughs> um, so why do we do test automation? So we, um, we do it so we don't make the same mistake twice. So when we write tests, hopefully we don't um, we make that same mistake twice. It allows us to cache issues earlier in the uh, development cycle, um, so we don't have to wait for a QA resource um, to catch something. They serve as documentation. Um, so a test is actually good documentation because it proves that the app actually does uh, what it's supposed to do. However, we can't test what we don't um, have a test for, so um, this is where we should focus our manual QA work. So there's basically three uh, types of tests. You've probably seen the, um, the test pyramid before. Um, so at the bottom, we've got unit tests. So they test a single function or um, a unit of code in isolation. Um, they're quick to run, so we, we write lots of these. Um, in the middle, we've got integration tests, so testing that those units work together. Um, and then finally, we have end-to-end -end tests. Um, and so they check that your application um, works as a user would experience it, so in the browser. Um, but because of that, they take, um, they take a lot of time to run. But the thing is, the further you go up the pyramid, the closer you're getting to how your application is actually experienced by an end user. So they might be slower, but they give you a lot more confidence um, that your application is working how you intended it. So in practice, it usually looks a lot more like this. This is the uh, testing Dorito. Um, so this is the test that you plan to write. These are the tests that you start writing. And then the tests that you delete because they're stupid and they take more time than they're worth. And finally, you kind of get a few tests down the end there. So 
writing tests can be seen as a burden, so we needed a way to make it easier um, so we could build it into our workflow, so it, it just happened by, by default. Um, so the other thing we needed to um, to because it's a decoupled site, um, we need to make a decision about where to actually write our tests. So do we test the front end and mock out the back end response? Or do we run the front end tests on the back end? Do both? Um, so often with a decoupled architecture, uh, there's a separate team implementing the front end and the back end, and it's often tempting to say that you just need to test um, the thing that you're concerned about there. But ultimately, um, your users don't care where the bug came from. Every bug is a front-end bug. And, um, and often it goes to the front-end team to triage and, and work that out. Um, so any end-to-end -end tests that we wrote had to be from the perspective of the citizen who's accessing the site. And so we decided to locate the tests closest to where that is um, in the front-end. So the great thing is there's lots of um, test frameworks at the moment in JavaScript land. Um, most have historically relied on Selenium and the WebDriver protocol um, to control the browser over REST API. So recently, though, there's been attempts to break away from this um, with uh, tools like Test Cafe and Cypress, which control the browser directly uh, using the native browser APIs. So here's some... Um, download stats from NPM um, over the past couple of years. Um, and you can see um, the tools that uh, control the browser directly, um, Cypress and Puppeteer, um, have got a, um, a big surge in popularity. And Nightwatch, um, which uses Selenium, is, um, is um, very distant. So Cypress in particular um, was attractive as it was clearly popular and it had good doc documentation and community. Um, it's got a great developer experience um, with a test runner that allows you to uh, debug in the browser. Um, however, because it controls um, the browser directly, it's only available for Chrome at the moment. Um, however, um, they do have uh, IE and um, Firefox in development. Uh, it's open source. Um, but it has a paid dashboard service, um, which is free at the moment for open source projects. And it's got a good uh, community of plugins. So one thing we were keen on doing is standardizing the, um, the format of um, the tests that we're writing. Um, so having tests in Drupal, we're, we're familiar with, um, with BHAT and using Cucumber Gherkin syntax. We wanted to, um, to bring that into the front end as well. So there's a plugin for Cypress called Cypress Cucumber Preprocessor, um, uh, which um, allows formatting Cypress tests um, in Gherkin syntax. So this is an example of um, a test written in Gherkin. So we have a scenario here as a, um, we have our feature rather, and we have some background, and then we have our scenario. So we're looking at a active legislation here. Um, and so when we go to, um, I don't know why that's happening. Um, when we go to visit the page, um, we check that the page title um, is there. And we can write it in, um, in plain English. Um, and then we take that um, and we take that statement and we wrap it in a step definition. And we use our Cypress Sci visit in this case to actually control the browser to go to that page. Um, and then we have another step here, which checks that the page title should equal what we expect there. And we can pass in variables there, so we can have this as a reusable test step. And this is what it looks like um, in the actual test runner itself. So um, on the right here, we have our um, site in action. On the left, we have the steps that are, um, that are running through here. So it actually goes to the page. It can control um, things like um, button clicks and whatnot. It can fill out forms. It can um, have any kind of interactivity there. Um, and hopefully, um, we have all green passing tests at the end there. So another thing that we we're um, keen to do was to um, bake in accessibility testing. Um, so making sure that um, we didn't have any um, easily detectable um, accessibility violations um, on there. 
And um, uh, sorry, one tool um, that we used there is um, a tool called AxeCore. Um, so there's a plugin for um, AxeCore in uh, Cypress, which allows us to um, go to the page and uh, run that automated tool over the page. And um, we can even put in um, what um, accessibility level that we want to um, test for. And we can also um, run it on specific areas of the page if we don't want to run it over the full page. So this will go to the page. And um, we can see um, it's run a check there. If we did something like um, change the um, background color to a non-accessible color, um, we would get a um, list of the detected errors there. And we can see, um, because we're in the browser, we, um, we've got full access to the DOM. We can inspect the DOM. And this gives us a list of um, DOM elements that, um, that uh, have failed accessibility check. Um, so I'm just going to uh, show you um, over here in the test runner what this actually looks like. Um, one of the cool things um, with the test runner is you can, um, you can um, it takes a snapshot of the DOM and it allows you to um, do time travel debugging. So you can um, click through here and, um, and see the state of the DOM um, uh, at each step. Um, so when we uh, click the button here, we can see exactly what um, was happening there. Um, and so it saves that um, snapshot of the, the DOM for you. So um, using Cypress to test the front end was working well, but um, we're relying on um, content and pages to be in Drupal already. So with, um, with traditional um, Drupal rendered sites, we've got one place to um, uh, locate our, um, our tests. Um, we've got one server to test. We can um, have one test that creates content and, um, and asserts that it's present on the, um, on the front end. With a um, decoupled site, though, um, we have to fetch content from the back end, and we need to create our test data then um, in the back end, um, which means that it's not located with where your um, tests are actually being written. Because if that content isn't there, um, obviously our, our tests fail. So, the other approach to this is that um, we actually mock out that response. Um, we don't connect to the, um, the back end at all. We just have a, um, a mock server in the middle there. So if your front end is using something like um, Axios um, to make um, a network request, there's an adapter for that called um, Axios Mock Adapter, which allows you to um, insert a, um, a mocked out response for any um, HTTP call. Um, there's also a nice um, Cypress plugin called um, Cypress Auto Recorder, which will actually watch all of your um, um, XHR requests and, um, and save them to a file for you, so you don't have to um, uh, manage those yourself. So there's pros and cons to mocking the response. Um, Mocking is obviously faster because you don't have to make that network request. It's more reliable um, because of that. Um, and probably a big one is you don't have to have a working backend to, um, to test. So it's good for implementing new features. Um, so you, you don't have to have an actual um, backend response. However, there's no certainty that the mock that you're using is the same as the response you'll get. So um, there's a chance that your mocks will be out of date and you need a way to keep that up to date. Um, so you still need to know that the back end is serving the correct response. And that's where um, uh, maybe like JSON schema uh, testing or contract testing uh, can help. And of course, you've got to keep those mocks up to date. So the problem was keeping the, um, those mocks um, with where the tests were located. So um, we decided that um, why don't we just upload um, 
content into the back end um, from the front end. So we use um, Cypress to actually um, log into the back end, upload um, fixtures using the YAML content module. Um, so we could save those um, YAML files um, with our front end tests and we can control them um, in there. Um, so one problem with that though is um, Cypress uh, actually has a, um, an issue here where um, they only allow visiting one domain per, um, per test, um, which means that you can't log into another domain, which the back end is, um, because it's in the same, same test. So um, we actually got around that um, by uh, running um, Puppeteer as well to, um, to log into the, the background, which is a bit of a hack, and it'd, it'd, be, um, it'd be nice that we wouldn't have to do that. Um, so that looks like this. Uh, so we actually have another browser that runs and uh, logs into the background, uploads some YAML file, and, um, and creates it in there. But it does mean that we can um, locate our tests and our, um, our test content um, together. So go a bit quick. <clears throat> so we've been able to uh, reduce a task now um, that was taking um, three days to, to test per side, mind you. Um, and we've been able to reduce that down to um, a, a roughly 15 minute um, test run. Um, so as we adopt this, our QA guys will be freed from um, doing that rote um, regression testing and we can um, get them to concentrate more on exploratory testing. So um, we, we get higher value out of our, um, our QA process rather than doing that um, repetitive work, which is really what computers and what we can get a robot to do. Um, getting the right amount of coverage has been tricky. So um, too much, um, too many tests and you've got more tests to maintain and um, there's a burden there. Too few and you risk um, missing something and that um, breaks the point. So um, we're probably not at a point where we've got the, um, the amount of coverage we'd like, but we're working towards that. And as we bake that into our process, hopefully um, we'll be able to um, uh, start with our tests um, as, as the first place that we're, we're going there. Um, and that's, um, that's pretty much it. Um, so there's some uh, links there to some of the, um, the tools that we're using there and um, to our Ripple and Tide uh, distributions. Cool. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, you said that uh, you can do WASAC testing, uh, but can it do WASAC 2.1 testing as well? Yeah, so it uses um, Axcore. Okay. Yeah, so um, Axcore, um, if you're familiar with it, allows you to um, fine tune those rules. Um, yes. And if there's specific rules that you don't want to include for whatever reason, you could, you could choose um, what set you'd want there. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. You. So you've got your automated tests all set up. What kind of things do you store manually test before a release actually goes out to production? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we, we still do that kind of exploratory. So there's always someone clicking through and, and doing that. It's just that, that um, the confidence there is that it, you, have, you have both. And I think there's really an argument to be made for, for both. Um, the motivation was really that we wanted to be able to release more quickly. Um, and you can't do that if you, you're waiting for someone to, to, like it was taking too long for, we worked out I think the amount of time that it would take across all the sites that we wanted to deploy to, would have, we'd have three months of just testing in the end of it, you know, it wasn't, wasn't reality. So, um, so we would just reduce the, um, the complexity of those tests that a manual tester does, and it's really just a sanity check um, for, for a manual tester. Just general kind of clicking around the, yeah. the basics. Yeah, 
and um, and I feel like that's just um, it's just that confidence. Um, so knowing that it is right and, and checking. And I think we're still in the process of um, you know, validating the automated test there by a QA person doing those checks. Yeah. So um, the focus was like testing the integration between the backend and the, fr the, the focus was about testing the integration between the backend and the front end. But did you test like the front end application by itself as well? And if so, was the tooling that you choose, uh, you know, that, that selection was on purpose to be able to test the view components, for example, and also yeah. the integration? Yeah, sure. So um, as I mentioned, like, it's part of the stack of testing. Um, so we have unit tests across our components. Um, and so we use, um, we actually use um, Storybook, um, and we have a, um, for viewing our components as a um, test suite, I guess. And we have snapshot testing there. So we know that if anything changes between snapshots, we, um, we've got that. We also have unit testing um, for uh, component functionality. Um, but then we have that layer on top, which, um, which is really that end-to-end that -end part gives you a lot more confidence that they work um, in concert with um, particularly the back-end response. So <coughs> If the, um, the backend response is changing, you know we, we've had breaks in JSON API responses that have broken the, the site there. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of value in that end-to-end -end side of things as well. Uh, Thank you. Just wondering, does uh, Cypress uh, support uh, sort of performance fixtures? Can you do? Uh, tests on time to first byte and image size, for example? That's a good question. Um, you could, you have access to um, the browser, so you could, um, you could potentially write a, a browser, a, a plugin for Cypress too. Um, any um, Cypress task can be uh, customized, so you could, um, you could watch um, the window and, and um, write your own test there. There's nothing to my knowledge that exists currently for that, um, but I, I think that'd be a good plugin for, for Cypress to be able to test that, yeah. No? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.